Beetles are small creatures that are bright and beautiful. In most places, beetles are the symbol of regeneration, renewal, and the symbol of the sun. I wonder if the beetles got their inspiration from that. Dung beetles were sacred in Egypt. Their dung ball rolling reminded people that the god rolled the sun through the underworld at night and pushed it over the horizon in the morning. The word beetle actually originates in Old English with the meaning of the little biter. Beetles have major economic environmental significance by controlling pests. For example, the lady beetles found on they feed on aphids. Beetles are common predators of many insect pests. Ground beetles, for instance, can help control weeds by eating their seeds. This can help to decrease the use of herbicides. Dung beetles are important for improving soil fertility and nutrient cycling like nitrogen. And there's actually quite a few funny videos on dung beetles that you should check out on YouTube. Beetles make up 25% of all animal species. That means one in four animals is a beetle. One third of insects are beetles. There are over 400,000 identified species worldwide with more to be identified. There are 30,000 species recorded in the United States and Canada. Beetles are not significant carriers of disease in contrast to other insects like mosquitoes that can bring disease and even human death. Beetles are never blood sucking parasites. They do not contain venom and they will not sting like wasps or bees. However, when you see these Asian lady beetles, Harmoniax ridus, they can bite humans. They have 19 black spots and an M on their forehead. And it looks like a W here. But when you look at it in th this angle, it's a little M. In order to better understand beetles and what we can do to protect them, we must delve into the aspects of their anatomy, life cycle, where they live, eat, and mate. During this talk, we will explore common beetles found in the Urban Ecology Center parks. We'll look at new beetles that were identified in Wisconsin just this year. And I'll also give recommendations on how you can help keep beetles thriving. The ultimate goal of entomologists, naturalists, ecologists, any scientist is to correctly identify beetles. One of the first way to arrive at a correct idea is to study the anatomy for clues. So when scientists describe beetles, they will commonly discuss anatomical characteristics. Some of the important structures seen on this top or dorsal view of the beetle are the pronotum, which is this structure right here, and the elytra. And the elytra is actually composed of two segments that is separated by a suture line right here. The taxonomic classification of beetles starts with phylum arthropoda, then class insecta, and then order coleoptera. In Greek, coleoptera means sheathed wing, which is also called elytra. The elytra is one of my favorite structures of the beetle. The elytra are the forward, often colorful wings that conceal the membranous flying wings when not in use. I have a YouTube video here to share with you from National Geographic that demonstrates the uncovering and unfolding of the flying wings. You will see that scientists actually developed a transparent artificial elytra for a beetle to study and to potentially improve engineered products like spacecraft, airplane, and satellites that have folding components. The scientists did find that the beetle folds the flying wing into a Z shape. Enjoy this for a few moments.
pretty cool. I love it. I love it. This slide shows the bottom or ventral view of the beetle. The segments that make up the body are head, thorax, and abdomen. Notice that the thorax is actually extended under the elytra. So here we have the pronotum, the bottom view or ventral view, and the thorax actually goes all the way to this level, containing all six of the legs on that particular segment. And then the abdomen are actually these ventrites. In order to begin placing a beetle in the right family and ultimately the genus species for a complete identification, the antenna characteristics are commonly used. And look at all of the varieties. Examples of antenna such as filiform or thread-like. They're serrate or sawtoothed, pectinate or comb-like, There's clavate where there's gradually enlarging antennomeres, which are subsegments of the antenna to form a club. Another example is capitate, where the outermost antennomere abruptly forms into a little club. The antenna can detect motion, odor, chemical substances, and of course, can be used to physically feel the surrounding environment. Body shapes also help with identification and include elongate. There are many variations of elliptical, variations of oval. There's even a triangular shape and ant-like shape. In addition to shape, size is very critical in the classification process. The female lays one egg or she lays batches of eggs. And they all, beetles undergo complete metamorphosis, which means there's an egg, larva, pupa, and adult stage. The instar is the stage between larval molts. Most species pass through three to five instars, and some can have more or less. On this particular um, image, you'll see several different instars on this one leaf. Each developmental stage is adapted to a particular season and set of environmental factors that ultimately will enhance the individual beetle's ability to survive extreme conditions. Adults and larvae are seldom found together in the same place at the same time. But look at this lady beetle. It's an exception. The adults emerge based on a combination of time, temperature, and moisture. So we have the adult, the pupa, and the larva, all on the same plant, which is a Canada goldenrod, just this fall. Beetles can be found in many environments, from mountaintops to freshwater locations. They can be found in prairies on flowers and stems and below the ground surface in different developmental stages. They can be found in freshwater or under rocks. They can be found in woodland habitats, under leaves, branches, or plant debris, in gardens, and in or on uh, rotting wood. Decaying organic matter is the primary diet for many species. Their diet can range from fungi, dung, dead animals, wood, plants, and even leaf litter. Cadaver frequenting or predaceous beetles are essential for decomposition and are seen actually after blowflies and other diptera have reduced the body to a dry carcass. Beetles also eat other invertebrates. Here you can see a seven spotted lady beetle foraging for aphids. Here's some aphids right here and actually some over here as well. 
Beetles foraging on flowers are equipped with anatomical structures like straws or sponges for ingesting nectar and pollen. Additionally, some of the beetles are known to be the primary pollinators of flowers and they frequent in search of mates, shelter, and food. Beetles rare, rarely use their defensive tools on humans, but look at this guy. Those pinchers can inflict quite a pinch. They can actually lacerate the skin with their razor sharp regions of their prothorax as well. Beetles can even use camouflage or mimic other insects, especially those that feed on wood or vegetation. This locust borer with its adorable W on its elytra looks just like a bee, but does not sting and is not a bee at all. In fact, it does more damage, unfortunately, to the locusts. Click beetles can make a startling click to ward off predators. Some scarab beetles can roll into a crush resistant ball to play dead or to roll into nearby leaf litter. And beetles can even look like litter, also called frass by coleopterists on leaves like this warty leaf beetle. I found this little guy uh, this, this season and I seriously thought it was a little bit of debris. Very, very small. I think he's only like 1.6 millimeters uh, on a leaf. And I took him home and oh, he has such rugged little armor. I love this beetle. Adults invest a great deal in physical defenses like armor, weaponry, and chemical defenses to deter predators, of course. But the chemical mechanisms beetles use are probably the most important tool to protect them from predators and even people. The bombardier beetle can blast hot benzoquinones from defensive glands. This produces a local and minor reaction on their predators. You should YouTube this uh, bombardier beetle. It is quite, uh, it is actually kind of funny to watch what they can do. The blistering agent, cantharidin, is the most known dangerous poison that beetles can synthesize and it is distributed throughout the body and the hemolymph, particularly the blister beetle. However, this agent is used also as a safe treatment to remove skin warts, and can be potentially valuable in treating cancers and dermal infectious diseases. If you were to pick up this blister beetle, you may experience a local skin blister from the cantharidin, which is released from actually the knee joints and is also called reflex bleeding. Pedarins are concentrated in special glands and they're released when the beetle is squished or eaten by a predator. Beetles that produce this unpalatable chemical typically have contrasting red and black. This beetle in the red bordered picture also has aposomatic coloration or the red and black coloration. I use an AMSCOPE trinocular stereo microscope for identifying and photographing beetles. I use image focusing and merging software to take numerous pictures with my iPhone and then merge them into a single image. Since beetles are very small, at least the ones that I, I typically see, and 3D of course, you have to focus on many layers and merge them into one so the whole beetle can be in focus. I typically take a dorsal, ventral, side views, and, and additional anatomically important regions for identification in collaboration with other naturalists. When beginning to look at a beetle under the microscope, I start by taking measurements, particularly in millimeters, which is the recommended scientific unit of size. This is an important initial step in the classification process. So here's an example. The weevil is one of my favorite beetles. I liken them to earless elephants. They've got such long snouts. I just, and they are so very busy. Um, but they can also be very small and some can be very large. So when you look in a book or you look online and you were to see these three images, 
are they all the same size? Are they all the same genus species? In this case, they're all separated by one millimeter and they um, are in, there's two different families and of course different genuses, but it just goes to show um, the uh, immense diversity in beetles. Here's another example of some ground beetles and they are typically in the Carabidae family. And when, if you were to look at these online or in a book and you didn't know what the measurements were, you'd say, oh, this is the same beetle. It's the same size. Well, they're not. They are separated by, by just millimeters. They are definitely all in the same family, but they have many different genuses. When I am on a beetle survey, I will record the temperature. I'll record the GPS and habitat. The GPS image on this view is uh, at Three Bridges Park uh, on the side, um, side trail uh, looking for beetles. Looks like pretty early spring or during the drought period. And of course, habitat. So this little Chalignapus marginatus um, is on a flowering spurge, I'm not sure, or it could be a Queen Anne's lace, I'm not sure. But at any rate, I record the habitat. Remember, adults emerge based on a combination of time, temperature, and moisture. So you may see more activity in the morning on a hot day or in the afternoon on a cool day. This is an overall example of my beetle record. In the field, I'll, I will note what the date is, the location like Three Bridges Park or Riverside Park, the weather, the GPS marking, and what, it was, what the beetle was located on. Was it on the ground path? Was it on Queen Anne's Lace? Um, was it on giant ragweed? Then when evaluating the beetle, I'll record size and start looking at anatomical clues for identification. I will state where I located the beetle in a reference book that I typically use, which is usually the Evans Beetles book, and record if naturalists at bugguide.net had confirmed my identification and if maybe it was a first find for Wisconsin. After recently counting all the families seen in the United States and Canada on bugguide.net, there were 143 right now. The largest of all families is Curculionidae. Some examples of this family include snout and bark beetles, as well as my favorite, the weevil. In fact, both Curculionidae and Chrysomelidae combined make up one third of all 400,000 species of beetles. Here's an example of how to classify beetles down to genus species. So we'll start with Arthropoda, and then class, and then the order Coleoptera, which are beetles. And then we'll try um, to arrive at the genus species. Because there are more than 6,000 species of coccinellidae family, identification to the genus species is definitely a challenge. And in this case, this little seven spotted lady beetle is in the, is in the genus Coccinella septempunctata. And he has adorable little white contrasting triangles on the forward portion of the pronotum and a little triangular black spot, spot um, at the very top part of the elytra. These are some of the books that I typically reference. And so I really love the American um, Beatles volume one and two. Evans, Art Evans, uh, I, we regularly use his text or his book, Beatles of Eastern North America. He has now just published a Beatles of Western North America. He's a really terrific guy and would be great to go in the field with. Uh, his lab is just immense and so much fun um, with all of his specimens at any rate. So there's Marshall, who is a Canadian author. This is a really terrific book on natural history and diversity of beetles. 
there's the Peterson guide and then some, some pretty older uh, references, but are still very valuable. As we saw in the previous image of the seven spotted lady beetle, here is an example of one of my submissions from bugguide.net. So what I'll do is I'll take pictures and then I will place them uh, in a family coccinellity. I'll, I will give what I think is the genus species, in this case, Coccinella septum punctata. I'll give the common name, seven spotted beetle. And then the naturalists will um, give their final report as an italic um, name, which in this case is correct with the one I, that I had, had submitted. I'll give the where I located the beetle, the date, the size, and what it was found on. To this date, I have over 620 or more uh, submissions to bug guide. Um, for all the beetles um, that I've seen in the, in the three parks. Specimen preservation is really uh, kind of fun to talk about. Many coleopterists and enthusiasts will pin their beetles. I am still in the process of improving uh, image quality. And so I like having a, a fresh specimen that does not have any uh, pin to, to change the anatomy through the elytra. Um, so I place them in 50 to 70% alcohol. I'll label them with the family. I'll write down what the genus species is. I'll give the date. And then I color code the family, Scarabidae in this case, an orange. So this is just a flat uh, showing different uh, beetles that I've collected over time uh, with all of their different families. As a side note, it is not legal to collect or remove any specimens from the parks without prior authorization. As the lead citizen scientist for beetles at the Urban Ecology Center Parks, I have been granted permission to collect specimens for grant funded projects, as well as an invertebrate prairie predictor species project. Over the next few slides, I'm gonna share some common seasonal beetles seen in the prairies at the Urban Ecology Center parks. Riverside and Three Bridges parks are the largest prairies and thus a larger beetle population. That is also more diverse compared to the smaller prairie at Washington Park. However, Washington Park has demonstrated wonderful bio, beetle biodiversity in areas like the pond and orchard. Raganicha fulva, the common red soldier beetle in the family Cantharidae measures seven to 10 millimeters. I love this little beetle. And uh, this Queen Anne's lace is loaded with, with them uh, foraging and mating. And I know that the Queen Anne's lace is non-native, uh, but this is one of their, their favorite habitats, as well as Apiaceae, which celery, carrot, and parsley. And of course, Queen Anne's lace is in the carrot family. And Asteraceae, which are asters, daisies, and sunflowers. So let's look at some data. Um, we'll typically see this red soldier beetle in mid-July to late July. And on one particular day, I was able to count 90 species at Three Bridges, or excuse me, 90 uh, individuals uh, at Three Bridges Park and 87 on the same day. So that was a pretty popular day for this particular beetle to be out foraging and mating. The blister beetle, Zonitis fitigera, a ter totally terrific beetle in the family Meloidae. Meloidae. The size is usually seven to 12 millimeters. And examples of where they like to, to be and forage are on Asteraceae, as well as Leguminosae and Solanaceae. So examples of the legumes are legumes, of course, peas and beans, and examples of Solanaceae are tomatoes, potatoes, and peppers. 
This beetle, if you can see, has a very pronounced proboscis, um, so they can really um, get into the flower for foraging and, and retrieving nectar. Um, this is a, a really terrific beetle to see, and we normally see them mid to late July. And it looks like Riverside Park was the habitat of choice for this beetle this year, where I counted 12 um, uh, on July 20th and four at Three Bridges Park. They are not around for very long. The cucumber beetle, Diabrotica cristata. They're in the family Chrysomelidae. They're a little smaller at 4.1 to 4.7 millimeters. They have kind of a, a shiny black. They have a marginated um, elytra or a little lip, if you will, and two little dimples. Very fun to see, and they are very, very busy. Examples of poaceae are cereal grasses. Radishes are examples of raffinous genus. Lima beans are examples of fascia loose plants. And uh, the coneflower is where this particular beetle was on this image. The, this particular beetle likes to stay from mid-July and can stay around for about a month. And on one day, uh, I counted um, over about 155 individuals at Three Bridges Park, which is where this beetle really loves um, to, to linger longer. And, and then the beginning of August, over a hundred individuals were seen. A little less at Riverside Park, but still, still present. The goldenrod soldier beetle, oh boy, I can't wait to share this with you. Um, Chalignathus pensylvanicus, family cantharidae. The size is a little larger at nine to 12 millimeters, so easier to see, but look how camouflaged or mimicked it is in this Canada goldenrod, which is Solidago. The, the Chalignathus pensylvanicus has a unique um, marking on the pronotum, or it has a spot. An image uh, at the kind of the beginning, um, there was a Chalignathus marginatus where the black was actually a complete line from the head to the elytra. So it was just little subtleties that can make a difference in identification of a beetle. But look at these numbers, holy cow. So it looks like the end of July to kind of mid to late August is when we're gonna see this beetle. Three Bridges Park again was a favorite habitat. 413 individuals were seen on August 11th alone uh, when in combination in both parks. And look at this, nearly 560 individuals on August 18th at these two um, on this particular day. That's pretty darn impressive. So this is a great um, a beetle to, to count for those who really wanna roll up their sleeves and, and get their counter going to, to look at how extensive um, the bio, extensive, um, how many numbers there are in the parks. Black blister beetle, here's another, here's another Pennsylvanica or Epiquata Pennsylvanica. So there are numerous, I'm just, this just a side note, there are numerous animals that have Pennsylvanica or uh, a name similar to that uh, in their genus species naming or classification. It actually comes from Latin and it is usually where that particular animal has been found, um, like Pennsylvania. So other animals that have Pennsylvanica or Pennsylvanicus in their name are like the chestnut-sided warbler. There are some crickets that have that name and a mole that has that name and lots of beetles that have that name. So here we have Epiquata pensylvanica in the family Meloidae and size is seven to 15 millimeters and they love uh, asters and sunflowers.
So it looks like the end of August is when we're going to see the majority of them. And at Three Bridges Park, I was able to count 56 on August 25th. That's pretty impressive. They're a larger kind of an oily black coloration. Uh, and remember, don't pick them up. Um, you might get a little blister. Finding a beetle not yet identified in Wisconsin is extremely exciting. Contributing beetle submissions to bugguide.net provides data for other scientists, educators, and ecologists to reference and monitor ever-changing species distribution, habitat, and population density. Over the years, I have found many first finds in Wisconsin, but this year I've documented three. Neogallerosella calmariensis is in the family Chrysomelidae, black margined loosestrife beetle. I saw this little guy on a forget-me-not near the river at Riverside Park on June 2nd. And there's only a handful of states and uh, provinces in, in Canada in that, that have seen this beetle. What? Pardon me? Pardon me? I think you can go ahead, Heidi. It was uh, oh. an accidental unmute. Sorry. <laughs> Encode, Encodes Saracia is in the family Melendriidae, and it's a false darkling beetle. This beetle took me weeks and weeks and weeks to identify. I was looking for uh, looking at thousands of darkling beetles and was not seeing the typical anatomical characteristics. And then finally said, you know, let's look at the false darkling beetles. And after some searching, this is who I found. I saw him on July 27th in, uh, in the woodland periphery near the ephemeral pond uh, at Riverside Park. And I'm proud to say um, that we have this little guy on the, on the maps for Wisconsin. I am really excited to share this beetle with you. And I've worked with um, many bug guide naturalists to, to, to confirm the actual genus species of this little, this little weevil. On, on July 14th, I found him on a coneflower at Three Bridges Park. He is Kissingeria emora. I love the name. And look at that snout. It goes and goes and goes. Uh, and it is not curved at the tip, which is a common characteristic for one that looks just like him. At any rate, he's in the family Brent today, and he is a pear-shaped weevil. Here is the most exciting bit of information. This beetle was last seen in St. John, Kansas, the end of June, 1979. So over 40 years, this has not been documented on Bug Guide. And so he is now in Wisconsin and we're very fortunate to, to add him to the science community. What is needed to have a healthy habitat and what can you do? I'd say the first thing you can do is plant native plants. The Urban Ecology Center parks have terrific land stewards and they know a lot about native plants. You could always ask them and collaborate with them on what you could plant in your yard or garden. Plant pollinator flowers for bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and beetles. Avoid harmful chemicals. Try to stay away or avoid if you can pesticides, insecticides, and herbicides. It'll be good for your family and your pets as well. Avoid equipment using oil and gasoline and harvest that rainwater. Nourish your, your flowers and your, um, and your yard and garden more um, by using rainwater. Please consider modifying your yard or garden to become a healthy habitat for native wildlife. My mom encouraged many homeowners in her community in Georgia to become certified. Because of her work as a master gardener, Cherokee County is the first county 
to have over 140 homes certified as a wildlife habitat. Visit the Wildlife Federation on how to make your yard or garden certified as, as a healthy habitat for butterflies, bees, bats, birds, and beetles. Additionally, volunteer at a local park to help remove non-native plants and survey insects, birds, butterflies, dragonflies, and more. Now prepare yourself. I know Halloween is right around the corner, but here are some scary pictures of my 14-year-old Chihuahua, Pearl, all decked out in a homemade costume for a frightful holiday. It's been a real joy to share some of my beetle insights and, and data with you today. And please feel free to email anytime uh, and join me on a beetle survey. It'd be great to have some company and to, to share. Have a really great rest of your day. And I'm open to any questions that you may have. Mm -hmm.